you know uh, india will never give up the relationship with russia it is uh, it has been the steadiest relationship the only steady relationship of its kind and there are really no bilateral irritants you know working on the relationship leave alone conflict of interests so this relationship will continue and presently in fact as a result of the ukraine conflict and the uh, forces that it generated the india russia relationship has actually entered a golden age you know trade is booming <laughs> you know in the sense it's over 60 and i in fact even in this a visit by president putin to india uh, in a not too distant future you know and uh, in conversations between our prime minister modi and uh, putin they are the contacts are very very intense hello everybody this is pascal from neutrality studies and today i'm very honored to be joined by a former indian diplomat and realist thinker ambassador padra kumar Ambassador Badra Kumar was a career diplomat for three decades in the Indian Foreign Service with multi-year assignments in the former Soviet Union, Pakistan, Iran, Afghanistan and Turkey. Ambassador Badra Kumar writes extensively on the geopolitics of Eurasia, China, West Asia and US strategies. He writes a popular blog called Indian Punchline. He's a columnist at The Cradle and a syndicated columnist worldwide. Today we want to discuss India, BRICS and what the multipolar world order means for South Asia. Ambassador Badar Kumar, thank you very much for coming online today. Good morning Pascal, I'm really privileged to be invited by you. I am an avid follower of your podcast and uh, it's an intellectually stimulating platform for all of us today, you know. And uh, uh, very kind of you to invite me. I look forward to our conversation. Well, thank you very much for those kind words. I'm really happy when I hear thinkers like you say this because uh this exchange means a lot to me and you are a Indian professional diplomat. Maybe we can start with uh, an introduction. Can you tell us a little bit more where you served because you told me your your expertise is with Russia, uh, uh South Asia and and West Asia, right? Can you maybe outline your postings a little bit? Well you know uh, we have a, a system in the Indian Foreign Service that once you get uh, selected through an all India examination uh, into the uh, into the cadre then uh, a certain area a certain foreign language other than english english we consider to be our own language <laughs> another language other than english as a foreign language and then we get trained in uh, that and you know then there is a certain kind of uh, expertise that one is supposed to gather there so by way of that i was allotted i was uh, yeah, pretty high in my batch and uh, you know i therefore asked for russian as my first choice and chinese as my second uh, choice and i got the first choice which is the russian so i served in the former uh, soviet territory tri- uh, three times you know and i was trained in russian language in moscow state university so uh, but then you know we have also uh, a, a a culture a bureaucratic culture in india uh, to uh, train the foreign service people as eclectic minds you know that you are not button hold and, and uh, kept in a small niche and send, spending the rest of your time there like russian diplomats or chinese diplomats you know who just go to their assigned territory come back to headquarters go back again come back again like that you know so that is uh, not how we do it uh, we create eclectic minds you know who can apply themselves to uh, various regions various civilizations cultures and so on so um, i finished my training and came back and then as it happened as luck would have it i was co-opted into uh, the pakistan desk and uh, now pakistan iran afghanistan is one division in the one cluster in the foreign service here in our headquarters and uh, it is of course a highly prestigious work extremely challenging work can be very frustrating so it not only molds your personality and your work ethic and everything but also it is a highly sensitive desk and you get used to working under pressure now something like about 13 years uh, to 14 years passed in my career uh, in this area 
So, you know, uh, I really don't know, therefore, you know, what I am an expert in. My postings have been Soviet Union, um, South Korea, oh. Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Afghanistan, as you mentioned, Uzbekistan, uh, again, part of the Soviet Union. I was ambassador there after the uh, dissolution of the Soviet Union and when Uzbekistan became an independent country. And I was also at that time uh, Taliban, watching Taliban rule Afghanistan. Then uh, I went to uh, Islamabad, Pakistan, uh, and I went to Germany uh, and finally ended up in Turkey as ambassador. <laughs> So this is more or less a thing. I spent most of my time actually in the areas around India, and uh, I enjoyed it. But uh, I haven't had an exposure so much to the Western world. Which is very interesting, though, because now you also you write on an almost daily basis on 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 your wonderful blog, the Indian Punchline, and you do like geopolitical analysis in more or less the, the tradition of the realist school. And um, what is your observation at the moment of um, how India is developing inside BRICS and how BRICS is 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 developing as a as an alternative approach to to uh, a world to world order. You see, uh, let me start uh, saying at the outset that I my conviction, my belief, my my estimation is that uh, BRICS is still very much a work in progress. Mm -hmm. BRICS was conceived uh, before the world lost its innocence, in the sense before this uh, Ukraine and all that, you know, uh, in rather innocent times. And when uh, Medvedev was the president of Russia, and at that time itself, it was uh, the, the thought was there that the Bretton Woods system and uh, the uh, evolution of the international financial economic political institutions like United Nations and so on, were becoming archaic, you know, and uh, uh, upgrade is necessary because the international situation had changed and a lot of new forces had appeared in the world politics. And unless they get reflected, the decisions taken in these institutions will not be relevant anymore, you know. So this thought, uh, germinating in the minds of the Russians, Indians, and the Chinese, um, brought the two, the three leaders together for the first meeting, which took place, if I recollect correctly, in Russia. And uh, there, uh, Medvedev was the Russian president at that time. Uh, then, you know, uh, the thing is, uh, climate change and lots of other issues came. And uh, uh, the progress was very very, very slow, BRICS is, you know, that we went through the ritual of an annual meeting. But uh, other than that, nothing very substantive took place. But a sense of urgency came suddenly when, uh, you know, the world began falling apart from in the last two to three years' time. And when this sort of a uh, apocalyptic scenario began to appear, you know, in uh, uh, in 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 the in the world order in international politics, and out of that sense of urgency, BRICS shook itself up and has embarked on a course. Now, uh, conversations have taken place to harmonize viewpoints, but you know, BRICS is a very uh, very formidable challenge because uh, in BRICS, you know you do not take any decisions other than through total consensus, you know. And uh, there is no imposition of any by any country its views on the platform. It's not majority voting or anything like that. So uh, a culture needs to be, first of all, developed because uh, these three countries which initially formed BRICS, that is India, uh, Russia, and China, they, between them, amongst them also, there were differences, different viewpoints and different priorities and even certain strains and tensions in the relationships. So th this, is, this is where it is. And then, you know, the thing is, you know, it uh, breaks, therefore, hit the ground running when the Ukraine crisis erupted. 
and uh, i think it's uh, it's it's uh, it's uh, it's pace has been almost breathtaking in the last 2 to 3 years but i'm not very sure whether the final word has been said about it this brics has expanded expanded into the five member platform and now we have a, a it is a, gone to 10 members and then now we have a brics plus now all this is also taking place at a time when it is the world is transformative you know uh, it, in a, in a trans, passing through a transformative stage and uh, much is lying in the womb of time we don't know where it is going so india's predicament coming back to your question india's predicament is india is uh, has got certain uh, red lines here in the sense that india does not want brics to be confrontational you know india is uh, all for a unipolar world order democratization of uh, decision making in the international financial economic institutions and so on you mean multipolar world order right you said multipolar you multipolar, multipolar. World order. multipolar world order means there again india has a, uh, has a, its own compulsions you know we can get into get into some details later with regard to india china relations you know so you see um, uh, all these things therefore means that uh, india wants to speed up the process the transition but slowly you know <laughs> speed up but slowly paradox. yeah this is a paradox now for example india has also um, watched with dismay how you know uh, violating all international economic laws the foreign reserves of a country could be appropriated by some uh, group of countries which have power over world institutions and are now in fact even spending that money now this can visit india also in future this can visit at the start is perturbing the minds of a lot of people but at the same time india has no problem dealing with dollar the weaponization of dollar is not something that india has experienced you know we are we have no we are comfortable with swift and all this and uh, so if you take russia's predicaments or even china's predicaments uh, india cannot share it to that extent but what india wants is a, a value based system where there is democratization and uh, the uh, new forces that have emerged in the world order they must be accommodated and uh, they that the they and their presence must be legitimized so you know this is this is the way it is going as far as i can see uh, but india has not put any obstacles on the way and india has uh, gone along as far as i can see with uh, uh, consensus decisions even tempering its own viewpoints to accommodate itself and find a habitation that's the way it is put the, the those question are very of leaving question of leaving bricks over differences which the western press had been speculating uh, that india might do that is simply out of the question india is not going to leave it and india understands fully well the great importance of this platform Uh, as it is working with all its uh, nebulous incoherent character of functioning with no institutionalized uh, platform is working but and india feels that if it is not there it would have had to be reinvented it had to be invented today in the world needs it so there is no doubt about that I completely agree with you. The interesting thing is of course that leaders in Washington and in Brussels, the collective west they look at everything through the prism of friend or foe, with us or against us. And at the moment they're at a stage where they prefer to just ignore BRICS. It was like very ominous uh, how the Kazan meeting in Russia was just mostly absent from the major news platforms in in Europe and, and in the US. I was quite surprised. There was like, at, at best, there was a mention that some meeting took place, but that was it. When in, when in fact, this was a very uh, momentous uh, meeting, of course, because a lot of, a lot of 
decisions that are very impactful in the future, like having a, a, an additional category of states, of partner states, that those are very important decisions that were made. Um, uh, the interesting thing that you're saying is that BRICS will not be confrontational against the West, right? It will be it will be complementary and India would like to keep it that way. So India will also try not to let Russia and China maybe if if the aspiration was to use it against the West, India would certainly be a, a, a stop, would put stops to that, right? Yes, absolutely. Because you see, the point is uh, already, you know, do not un do not underestimate the ground, the, 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 the dimensions of the ground that have been covered and already in these last two to three years, you know, for example, the system being evolved for local payments in trade and uh, transactions between the BRICS member countries, BRICS lending institution, a bank has been created. Now, these are very solid achievements. And already as a, a as an observer, I am discerning that uh, the shine is going out of the G7 already. You know, G7 was the only uh, sheriff in town. And that's no longer the case. So now from this point onward, it can only be incrementally getting reflected that this platform, BRICS, in fact, represents much better portion of the world in terms of the GDP of the economy, their economies, population base, and growth rate, and so on. So, um, it is it is extremely important for India, in my uh, my assessment. I think so too. I, I have a question though, like how. Um... How do India and China manage to use this platform? Because on the one hand, there is now this, this bond between the two and they, they decided that they want to work together with the Russians and the Brazilians and South Africa and everybody else. At the same time, there are still border disputes. This is this is highly a highly creative way of... I mean, India and China have highly creative ways of dealing with conflict and making sure conflicts remain below the threshold of of open violence, right? Is BRICS helping with that process? See, BRICS, BRICS can ind indirectly help in the sense that, you know, that um, when you have differences with uh, another country, uh, when you work with them on issues which are not part of these differences, but where there is a common ground possible. Uh, the alchemy of your uh, uh, your uh, difficult relationship, otherwise difficult relationship, the alchemy changes. It is not perceptible always, you know, that even in the past, the border issue, for example, is nothing new. But uh, we know very well that in the Copenhagen summit, for example, India and China came together on climate change. And uh, it, it completely unnerved the industrial countries. And uh, in fact, in one meeting, a closed door meeting, which was taking place between the prime ministers of India and China to uh, work out a formula so th those so closely they were working a closed door meeting and the security guard stopped obama and obama said and the president and obama just walked in to break up that meeting and join that meeting there now you really? see uh, so you can imagine you know such things have also happened in the past so uh, this unfortunate uh, incident in the himalayas you know, in the uh, this uh, border skirmish which took place it was different. It was very different. It was very traumatic for India because you know, uh, a largely peace in a largely peaceful border, you know, blood had been shed, and that you know uh, creates an impossible situation to proceed further in the relationship. So India just left the trails, you know. But now that you know uh, the disengagement of forces and uh, followed by that uh, further in the downstream, the negotiations which are both sides are getting ready. Um, I envisage 
a gradual opening up and, uh, and, and uh, opening up in terms of a strategic communication beginning. Uh, and uh, in that uh, process, uh, certainly BRICS can help. BRICS will, be, uh, BRICS will give impetus to that process. But we had to first arrive at this point for uh, you know, making use of uh, forums, platforms like BRICS. And that was not available in the last two to three years. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic that there's even, a even, even there, even there, let me qualify this, that um, we did not put roadblocks in the BRICS. You know, uh, even though we had problems, because China has mentioned something, we must not, you know, look at it positively. That kind of a zero-sum mentality was never there. But uh, a working atmosphere was lacking in the relationship. And that got reflected also elsewhere in terms of in multilateral forums, international forums. But with this kind of a, with this kind of a, I can say a thaw, you know, that is visible in the last, um, since the 21st of last month uh, only, uh, if, if this process proceeds further and gains traction, these negotiations and dialogue, then naturally other things will open. Now, mind you, the uh, common interests also spread to the bilateral relationship huh? in the sense that uh, even in the dark period that we passed through, the two to three year time period, India-China trade was booming. And for India's manufacturing industry, uh, sourcing from China, is there is a criticality about it to, to, to be competitive, you know. Because China is next door, China's pricing, China quality of China's products, and the logistics of it getting things over, all this taken into account. And the government of India never prevented the big industry in Indian industry from sourcing from China, whether it is in terms of heavy cranes, whether it is in terms of machinery, you know, to tunnel through mountains for uh, developing roads and things like that. And China has tremendous expertise in that. And the, uh, relatively speaking, the equipments that we would otherwise have bought from the Western countries, you know, they would have been prohibitively expensive. And the budget would have uh, just gone through the ceiling, you know. So companies, uh, private companies, you know, who are in the business, they are interested in sourcing from China and they are aware of the potentials of it. In fact, one uh, compelling force that is working in the Indian system, at least I can say, is this the awareness that uh, this is a relationship which can contribute to India's overall development. And uh, that awareness is there, you know, in uh, business circles and business circles are invariably very influential with the political leadership. And uh, I have a feeling that even at the present level, even at the level of the leadership, that realization is there. So I am cautiously optimistic. I, I I I share that um, even just because it's it's more opportunities to actually exchange. But at the same time, we see how the United States is also trying to, of course, have a good relationship with India as much as possible and actually build what they are now calling minilateralism. Right, uh, India is part of the Quad. And the, the U U.S. and especially U.S. Uh, uh, analysts often interpret that as an alliance with India and, you know, being stronger together against China. Um, so while while India clearly says it doesn't want to 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 have this this adversarial relationships, part of people or uh, others that work with India interpret themselves as with India in an adversarial relationship. How do you make sense of that? Um, also the working with the Quad and and the Indo-Pacific strategy of the Americans? You see, it's not really very difficult for India because, uh, you know, the, um, the pivot of India's foreign policy is its uh, strategic autonomy. And this is uh, not something which India invented. This is something which is derived from our anti-colonial struggle, you know, the uh, uh, before the independence, the freedom struggle, as we call it. Even. Mm -hmm. So you see, uh, this has been found to be 
very useful and necessary for India. And this strategic autonomy really implies that, you know, that we will not be the military ally of any country, not only the United States, but even of Russia or some other country. And uh, we will reserve our independent, uh, our capacity for independent judgment, independent pursuit of independent foreign policies. Because the core is in terms of our safeguarding our interests. And therefore, the strategic autonomy is very important. And those Americans who claim uh, that it is an alliance system, I think, you know, uh, sometimes, you know, there's a bombastic rhetoric, you know. And I think the uh, well-informed people and the people who matter in the American system, they have, they not only know that it is not an ally, alliance, and they are even reconciling with the reality that India can never be an ally, like France realized much earlier. Yeah. You know, it can never be an ally like that. So it'll, uh, it, it can be a partner, and it can be a very consequential relationship for Western interests also, and for Indian interests. But... Uh, a block mentality is not something that can be expected from India. Now, this is something that I'm very interested in. Also, in terms of jargon, like strategic autonomy is clearly a very positive concept that, that's currently used by a lot of um, diplomats and also uh, policymakers. Um, how do you differentiate strategic autonomy from non-alignment, from neutrality? Uh, maybe I should rename my channel to strate uh, strategic uh, autonomy uh, studies, <laughs> but um, they, they somehow go together, but they're not the same. What's your What's your take at that? You know, our for present foreign minister, who was a professional diplomat before, um, he presented, projected a concept which was very striking. And it uh, probably gives the best expression to what is happening. He said that uh, it is not uh, non aligned, uh, the strategic autonomy cannot be looked at it in terms of non-alignment. But what is taking place is actually multi-alignment. You know, there's a difference. Mm -hmm. You may you might think, you know, that uh, constructive engagement is necessary for India because since the 1990s, since the end of the Cold War, India has been diversifying its interests. Market entered the Indian economic policies in a big way. And to the extent possible, India had begun to globalize. And because the stress was on uh, giving spur to growth and uh, facilitate development and create an external environment which is conducive for that. Because you, you have probably you are not aware of the staggering dimensions of the unemployment problem in India. We have covered a lot of ground in eradicating abject poverty you know, as it existed when the British left India. But uh, unemployment is a very big problem because these universities are churning out tens of millions of uh, youth into the market, into the system, and they must be getting employment. Otherwise, you know, a socially explosive situation arises, which may even undermine the foundations of India's democratic system. You know, it can happen, you know. So it is not happening, and it is, we are nowhere near that. But I am saying that, you know, that this is the specter that haunts India's policymakers. And uh, therefore, you know, the, the stress is so much on that, that aspect of it, you know. And for that purpose, now we need technology. We need capital. We need markets. If you take United States, for example, United States is India's biggest trading partner. China, along with China, is still. But, and the qualitative difference is the United States, we have actually a balance of trade which is in our favor. Unlike with the case with China, we hardly export anything to China. But uh, in the case of the United States, Indian export industry makes a lot of money in that. And then there are other aspects to it also, you know, that hundreds of thousands of Indians, you know, students go there year after year to the U.S. for study. And there is an Indian community there, uh, which is...
it's uh, flourishing, which is uh, really high quality, of high quality in terms of their educational background and so on. And you can see uh, the, the, their presence now in all walks of life in America. So it's a, it's a, and then, uh, you know, as the relationship is warmed up in the post-Cold War era, there is a greater willingness and readiness on the part of the United States to transfer technology to India. And we're still not happy with the pace of that transfer, but that's a different story. We would have liked to have much, much uh, smoother and much bigger volumes of transfer of technology, cutting edge technology to India. And uh, now we are even beginning to uh, discuss about how to collaborate on artificial intelligence. So we have we are entering that kind of frontier areas, you know. So uh, these are not things, you know, which we can get from other countries. I don't think at this level of technology is um, Russia is anywhere near it, you know. So it is a it's a technology that you know we need uh, if to build ourselves up. I mean, it's a technology which is available only from the United States. So you can imagine that it be. And then um, in the if you took it from the American prism. There is a bipartisan consensus, whatever might be their motivations in cultivating India and keeping India as a very close partner. There's a bipartisan consensus. And therefore, you know, India is probably one of the few countries which is not just put up at all that Trump has won this election. You know, the transition from Biden to Trump would be as smooth as velvet. You know? <laughs> so we have no problem. Uh, so uh, I know uh, how many countries are... Uh, in a in a position like that to offer India something, and in fact, uh, uh, without this relationship, I really doubt if India's growth and development at the present pace is even sustainable. You know, over a period of time. Are you are you worried because the I I do see that India has a very very strong position actually because it is multi aligned because it has friends everywhere but the danger is that th they might start using these connections to put pressure on on the strategic autonomous party um the in the sense that they start saying like okay it's the conditionality you know okay you get access to uh, to this kind of uh uh, um, information technology, but only if you stop buying oil from Russia and so on. Um, how can India man navigate these these demands that might come not just from the United States, but also might might come from from BRICS members to say like we need India needs to move in a certain way with us instead of instead of like giving in to demands coming from the US or from the European Union because both of these actors the Europeans and the Americans are still exploiting their structural uh, dominance through the existing uh, global infrastructure that they have. You see, you you mentioned as example oil. Now, let me just uh, explain what really happened. That uh, because of the close relationship with Russia... Can you come a little bit closer the... to the camera? It's yeah, uh, yeah. The microphone if, gets weak when you go too far away. If, uh, if you look at it uh, closely, uh, what happened was the Western world snapped the energy cooperation with Germany particularly, with Russia which actually dated back to the Soviet era, as you know, the gas pipelines and oil pipelines and so on. Now, uh, that opened up an opportunity for India because for Russia, it became necessary to seek alternate markets. And the alternate markets, they prioritized Asia and therefore, and India is a booming economy and uh, is a huge uh, uh, importer of uh, oil. So there it is readily available in the Asian continent itself. So the Russians also took a lot of interest because at earlier time, they were in a very comfortable position just transferring to Europe next door and making money out of it, you know, good money out of it. And they were really not pursuing at all the, uh, the opportunities of the Indian market. Now that opened up. Now this is not something that we created. This is a fact on the ground 
that appeared as a result of the tensions between the West and Russia. And Russia was also under compulsion to sell it at competitive price, the product. And if, I mean, it's common sense if somebody is, you know, uh, offering you a product at such competitive price with discount and uh, unlimited potential for, in terms of volume, to meet the uh, uh, requirements of the economy, which will keep the engine running here, who will say no? So this is strategic autonomy actually, in, in full display. In, I told you that in terms of our interests, is strategic autonomy, and you know, India would not, would not have allowed anybody to stop it unless they offered similar terms of energy to India. And then, then there is a twist to the tail also after that, what happened. This oil that we took from Russia meant that India vacated the world oil market. Otherwise, you can imagine the spiraling effect of it in the Indian in, in the world market in terms of oil price. So the Western world had to source from alternate sources. And those alternate sources became affordable, became, you know, uh, not so pricey as it would have been if India were also buying it. Like, you know, we uh, we were buying very heavily from the Gulf region. But with the Russian oil coming in, Russia now is, uh, you know, the, by far the major supplier of oil for us. Which means, you know, that that much oil India is not taking from the world market. Which means the price is stable enough for the Western countries also. This is one aspect of it. This, the Americans realized it. from Almost from day one, they realized it. So the rhetoric apart... The rhetoric that you know India is you know like uh, the EU Commission President you know she's a, <laughs> a very aggressive personality. So she said you know that you will be finding yourself in a foxhole, that you will suffer reputational damage and all that. That all turned out to be nonsensical, because the Americans didn't really put pressure after some time on India when they realized how the market forces are working, and actually. One can argue that India was doing a favor for the West. Number one. Number two, uh, the oil that was brought from there, we give value added uh, content to it, in injected into it by making them into petroleum products, and we sold them directly to Europe. So, petroleum products means you know that you know you get. A, a significant profit margin there, you know, other than crude, compared to crude, is a value-added thing, and you know, the price goes up. So India made good money. The West European uh, economies, you know, which needed, which were importing the petroleum products from Russia, needed the petroleum products, and they were not in too many places from where they could buy. So India sold to them also. And nobody could was a wiser because the point is once the oil sh is shipped to India and comes to India and oil come other parts of the world also come to India they all get mixed up so you nobody can say that this petroleum product is out of Russian oil but they were largely out of Russian oil <laughs> so you see it's a it's a complicated story you know and when you simplify it you know it's it's a uh, subtlety is lost on that. And that is why, you know, I frankly think, you know, that uh, the Western world is not in a position to impose any kind of sanctions or to punish India on account of this. The Americans didn't do that, you know. And we were also buying from America, you know. Now, I'm... the point is, uh, initially, when the sanctions came on Russia like that, you know, thousands and thousands of sanctions came, like they, like that, uh, they tested the water. Americans also tested the water and found that India was cannot be pushed. Now uh, it'll it'll hunger down if it is pushed beyond a point, because it's a time tested relationship. There is a very big uh, military relationship. Something like uh, sixty percent of the uh, arms used by the Indian military are of Russian origin. 
and it's unrealistic you know with a, a country like india with such border problems and so on with on two fronts pakistan and china it's unrealistic to push because you know uh, the politics is the art of the possible and if you do not uh, keep that in mind that if you just keep pushing you won't achieve anything and you will spoil the relationship that that is true that is absolutely true and i'm very um, you put my mind a lot at ease by this explanation also about the oil that's those are very good points i just also remember you know how uh, your neighbor pakistan in 2022 was also trying to remain between like not to take sides imra khan Uh, officially said we are not going to take sides in this conflict and then he was accused actually by an under secretary of state of aggressive neutrality and sure enough only a couple of months later mr khan was removed from power by pakistani um well, military uh, uh circles right and it is widely uh, um assumed or like we have we have recordings that the the united states was giving a thumbs up to the people who remove who removed him to actually to do so now pakistan also has a history of of removals of uh, of prime minister uh, prime ministers and of the military stepping in every once in a while and india is of course is is in a different position but is there any worries that that india might might like have suffer from repercussions for not falling in line enough with the west is the comparison the analogy pakistan's analogy doesn't hold good for india mm. because the point is you know we have a very stable political system and undermining that system is very difficult and india is uh, almost a continent yeah and you can imagine to stir up a revolution like in pakistan a color revolution like in pakistan which the military backed and uh, brought about a regime change there that is not possible to do in india you must remember that you know because you see if you uh, look into the indian system our uh, state governments enjoy a lot of autonomy and some of them are very obstinate and very tough when they are uh, governed by the opposition parties you know so they cannot be pushed around and you cannot uh, micromanage a country like that you know a, a country with such diversity as india that is number one number two the point is who stands to gain out of it because india is a an attractive proposition as a partner country now for instance uh, germany if take the example of germany it is facing deindustrialization and is looking for new partnerships and americans uh, prevented it from having relationship with russia russia would have been a natural partner for germany and is also blocking uh, is also expecting germany to roll back the relationship with china mm-hmm. now actually there is nothing beyond that which brought chancellor schulz to india just three weeks ago or that our prime minister is going next week to stuttgart to have a business session there uh, you know what I, what i'm saying is that uh, it is uh, common sense that you don't kill something which is very productive mm-hmm. because you'll be shooting at your own feet number two the point is you know it's a it's a growing market fast growing market how many markets are there this is actually the last big unexplored market in the world because indian uh, market has been a sheltered market and we have you know very shyly very incrementally we have opened up our market it's uh, still a long way to go so no country will want to uh, deny itself the business opportunities in a market like this in 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 the present situation where you know protectionism is uh, a phenomenon all over the world so you know when you take all these things and then another thing is as they told you about brics not being confrontational actually this is indian dna you know in the sense that you know that we are not confrontational and we have not taken sides with russia or ukraine also and uh, we are not confrontational with the and we are not going into the rooftop and you know started becoming very rhetorical 
about you know American intervention in Ukraine. Because what takes place, the Americans also have been doing the proxy war. And uh, why, why did you do this NATO expansion? We are not asking those uncomfortable questions also. We understood everything that is going on. And these are the realities of international life. And we went on with our own life. So, you know, when a country does it like that, uh, where is the scope, in fact, you know, for pressuring it? Pressuring means what? They will themselves be losing something out of it, out of this relationship. And it is the United States' formulation, President Biden's formulation, that India is one of the most consequential relationships of the 21st century. It's, it's I'm actually, quote, unquote, I'm saying the expression. So uh, when there is, it's, it's so profoundly meaningful, the relationship is, it's not going to happen. And India is uh, smart enough to understand these things. And in any case, uh, we have a leadership which is very nationalistic. And I don't think that, you know, that they will in any case, you know, surrender the legitimate interests or play or allow India to play a subaltern role to any foreign power. So I think the Pakistani analogy doesn't hold good for India, you know, if uh, if I may submit it that way. No, that, 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 that makes a lot of sense also how India is able to play this role at the moment because there are structural reasons that enable India to be um, in this position of strategic autonomy. And maybe uh, as a follow-up question, where do you see the relationship with Russia developing since you've, you've looked at that for a long time, and you recently also wrote an article uh, on Russia, India, and the end of the Pax Americana, um, because you're saying both of them are early movers. Can you maybe explain that um, that notion a little? You know, uh, India will never give up the relationship with Russia. It is uh, it has been the steadiest relationship, the only steady relationship of its kind, and there are really no bilateral irritants. You know working on the relationship, leave alone conflict of interests. So this relationship will continue. And presently, in fact, as a result of the Ukraine conflict and the uh, forces that it generated, the India-Russia relationship has actually entered a golden age. You know, trade is booming <laughs> in the sense it's over 60. And I, in fact, even envisage a visit by President Putin to India. Uh, in a not too distant future, you know, and uh, conversations between our Prime Minister Modi and uh, Putin, they are, the contacts are very, very intense, you know, and uh, there is a very good understanding of the Russian concerns in the Indian mind, and there is a very good understanding of uh, how to handle India on the part of Russia also, and Russia has never pressured India. Russia has never made demands on India and that, you know, that you do this, you cannot buy this from that country, you cannot do this with the United States. They have never told us that. So uh, that is out of uh, the partnership that developed through the last, uh, you know, five, six decades without any problem-free uh, relationship that developed. So I think that it will continue. And that is why uh, in, the, in the Western media, there's a lot of uh, speculation whether there's a big uh, jump in uh, China-Russia relationship. You know, it's at a height which their history has never experienced before, the China-Russia relationship. Now, uh, co common sense is like this. I mean, it would appear to be common sense that when India has a problem with China, when China has a China has a close friendship with Russia, India should be careful about the relationship with Russia. No, that's not really the case. What is happening, you know, because India is extremely comfortable with this one that uh, Russia will never, never, ever hurt Indian interests. So you know that is the kind of uh, matrix of understanding that is existing between the two countries, and the rest is so the. Uh, the relation, India's relationship with America is something that uh, Russia can learn to live with. And it will not, they know that it will not come at the cost of India's relationship with Russia. 
That's a that's a very it's actually a very very beneficial position to be in, and at the same time, yeah. India is also very well received in in Japan and South Korea, and the I think also with ASEAN, India has nothing but beneficial relationships. Um, it's a kind no, of a bold position at the moment. Yeah, I actually uh, I must actually add a caveat there. Yeah, from my point of view, you know, is that uh, the. Uh, Indian foreign policy must diversify further, you know, that, uh, for instance, you mentioned about ASEAN. I am uh, very unhappy that sufficient attention is not being paid to ASEAN, you know, by India. It's a fast-growing area. There's great civilizational affinity between that region and India. Even our epics are, you know, popular literature. And uh, you've lived in that part of uh, Asia, isn't it? Huh? You have lived in no. I've never lived in an ASEAN country, but I've traveled to many of to have traveled. Oh, yeah, yeah, but... yeah. So you can you know the the traces of uh, the civilizational bonding you know still exists there, and uh, therefore you know uh, India has a lot of potential to build up there. I was happy that you know that uh, our foreign minister undertook a serious tour of the region. To, uh, recently on this. So let's hope it happens. You know, uh, the Middle East is getting a lot of attention in the Indian uh, foreign policy. And it should not be a US centric issue. Uh, like, you know, in the common parlance, let me say that it's not also useful to put all the eggs in the American basket. You know, it's uh, we must also have our own. Uh, more, more and more other countries are also doing the same way and they're also following India's example. Look at Saudi Arabia. For example, the United Arab Emirates, you know, they are very strong allies of the United States, but now, you know, they have gravitated towards BRICS, you know. So do, do you think yes. do you think these states are learning like from other BRIC states, including India, how to how to be more multi aligned? Yes, actually, that is why I said that are one of the most creative uh, formulations of uh, and the, by the decision makers has been this foreign minister's concept of multi-alignment, you know, and uh, this is uh, found. I think this is this is this this is uh, going to be an interesting thought for more and more countries as we as we pass. Now, it is taking place in very different directions. A NATO member like Turkey applying for BRICS membership is itself showing that it is not only a phenomenon in the global south, you know that we want all kinds of relationships. We wouldn't be surprised if, uh, you know, Viktor Orban, you know, Hungary, seeks membership of BRICS, you know, it can happen, very well happen. And last uh, Kazan meeting, summit meeting of uh, BRICS, the Russian officials in their media interactions I read, they said that, you know, that, uh, I think Peskov said it, the Kremlin spokesman, that, uh, you know, that BRICS is open to even Western countries. You know, you see, so that is, uh, that is, uh, this is something like this multi-alignment is uh, actually the torchlight of the future, you know, for uh, more and more countries as we pass. But, you know, this, you, you are aligned with a lot of other countries. And I think it will also have indirectly a calming influence on the global uh, scale. You know, in the sense that, you know, when you're multi-aligned like that and you're not taking sides, then uh, what you finally come to is that, you know, that you would like to see harmony between all of them yeah. because it's still your, your, your own interests. You know, you know my, my, my favorite definition of like a neutral actor in international relations comes from Thucydides, who said, friends to all and foe to none or foe to neither. And Aristotle, Aristotle said that. Hmm? Uh, Aristotle that's... said that. <laughs> I, I wrote recently. I was reading actually Greek, the old classics, you know. So I came across this that Aristotle said this, you know, that uh, if one who is a friend to all is a friend to none. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Uh, so to to Thucydides said, friend to all and foe to neither. So friends to everybody and, and, and enemy to nobody. No, that's a noble thought. 
That's so and that's <laughs> that and that and that's to, that's Thucydides. And at the same time, in India, by the way, we have Cautilia, who also wrote about how to out of which out of which kind of um, uh, which kind of motivations to remain multi-aligned or remain remain neutral. So in a sense, India is a is a very is a, is a very classic case of a str highly strategic place and highly of, of uh, um, highly strategic thinkers to go into into multi-alignment but maybe just because you were there in the 19 in in the 1980s and and you saw this development of indian foreign policy india was also a champion of the non-aligned movement right so how do you explain to yourself that india did this transition from non-alignment to multi-alignment and that did it so like naturally See, India was a founder of the non-aligned movement. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, this is why I said that, you know, that about uh, BRICS, you know, I am keeping my eyes and ears open because now that we've gotten to this uh, phase of BRICS plus, how the decision making and how the progression is going to take place is something which is a work in progress. I told you at the beginning. You know, this is partly uh, because of the disparate experience that we had with regard to the non-aligned movement. Non-aligned movement was, uh, again, like the noble thought that you projected, it was a reflection of that, you know, and uh, that was non-aligned movement. The quintessence of non-aligned movement was what you reflected. But then look at and see what happened is, when it was found attractive as a proposition, a lot of countries wanted to migrate to it. And it became really the biggest tent in the in the world order, you know, non-aligned movement. But then the point is, it also needed a certain kind of culture. What happened incrementally is that you know the old war uh, tendencies crept into that tent, mm. in the sense that you know that a very pronounced. Uh, I mean, it's it's a uh, it was only to be expected when you have a gentleman like Fidel Castro, you know, as a member of the as a member of the non-aligned movement. So you know, uh, then it it took incrementally a um, non-Western anti from a non-Western perspective to an anti-Western hostile rhetoric. India felt frankly very uncomfortable with that. So this uh, took place, I can say, somewhere around the 1970s end or something like that. Then uh, the first withdrawal symptom began appearing. India continued to be a member of the non-aligned movement, but it became passive observer. It became a passive observer, things like that, because this is not what it was meant to be in the Indian scheme of things. And uh, to you know, hitting one against the other, or anything like that. So you know, the uh, multi alignment is actually, uh, as our foreign minister conceived, you know, he is also a historical dimension to a career diplomat with a historical memory. Uh, it's a it's an adaptation of the positive impulses of non aligned moment. Uh, before the hijacking took place uh, and its application to the new circumstances in the international situation. It's, it's an upgrade in a way because uh, it's, a, uh, it's a situation today where we are no longer in the bipolar world. We are in a multi, we are progressing towards a multipolar world. And uh, more and more power centers are going to appear in the world. It will not come to the final stage still. It is still continuing. And uh, very dramatic changes are in the offing, naturally. So then uh, multi-alignment will mean that, you know, a very big basket of partnerships, you know, is going to develop there. And uh, that is not something it is completely, uh, it's vastly different from the non-aligned. Let me put it like that, to symbol. It's, it's not non-aligned. The world has changed. India has changed. And the non-aligned movement has uh, lost its relevance. Mm. 
and something new had to be found you know yeah yeah i i agree i see that i i see, I see that now in the beginning three years ago i thought the non aligned movement would be strengthened again but it's actually it's bricks it's the bricks idea and the non confrontational mm -hmm. version of the num that is that is being strengthened now that is a you very know, even when you take bricks for that matter bricks also faces the danger because the point is um, uh, BRICS has accepted it, that it is not going to be anti-Western. It's official position of BRICS. But if you look at, say, the certain speeches of certain leaders there, the very heavy doses of anti-Westernism yeah. in their speeches in the, on, the, on the BRICS platform, you know? So there is always a danger of that kind of a thing happening. And if that kind of a thing happens, I think, I think frankly, in that case, BRICS will lose its relevance and will lose its uh, influence and uh, uh, its attraction to a lot of countries. And India will feel definitely uncomfortable with that. So uh, I think we, we will not go into a that kind of a gloomy prognosis is not necessary because we will not go into that. Much of what we are happening today is in the heat of the moment, you know, this proxy war that is being fought there. And if a settlement takes place, Russia actually is a European power. And if, uh, you know, it goes back and takes a place in, the, in a common European form, then everything changes. I'm not trying to say that Russia will give up all this democratization of the world order and so on. Once bitten, twice shy, Russia will definitely pursue this track. But uh, the, that kind of a necessity is no longer there to uh, come up with ideas to hurt the dollar's dominance, so on. You know, if sanctions are removed, for example, which one cannot uh, entirely be dismissing, if sanctions are removed against Russia, and it can trade in dollars. Where do we stand? Then it stands where India stands. And Russia is a booming economy. And it's massive reserves, you know. So uh, everyone stands to gain, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, I absolutely agreed. Um, we Unfortunately, we reached a one-hour mark. And um, I would like to thank you very much, Ambassador Madhara Kumar, I mean, this was this was very uh, enlightening. If people who would like to follow your analysis, they should go to your blog, right? Yeah. My blog is uh, generally, you know, I put everything that I write unless I'm, I forget something uh, in, into the blog. In, and I have a website, you know, so that website uh, captures it, you know, all my writings. Yes. Huh? Yes, and by the way, if you, if any one of you uses a uh, RSS reader, you can just input it there, and then you you automatically get the new the new articles from Mr. Badra Kumar. Uh, oh, is so? I'm if not you... tech savvy. I'm not tech savvy. <laughs> and it's called an RSS reader. RSS reader, and okay. then you just they are okay. most of them are free. You add you add the homepage, and then the new articles will pop up like on a on a news on a news feed. It's highly. I, I I just write in uh, my uh, blog, you know, and put it in my uh, website on my website, and I put on uh, Facebook and post it on Facebook and Twitter. That's all I do. Everybody, please so, go and find Ambassador Badra Kumar uh, online. Ambassador, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. And I wish you all success for your uh, podcast. And it's a very competitive, I know you're a very competitive environment, but you're doing very well. And I'm happy to know that you're doing very well because your views are uh, very attractive as far as I'm concerned. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you. All the best.